Thank you. The next item of business is portfolio questions. I would like to get as many people in as possible because I think if you take the trouble to put a question down, we should all try to reach you. It's a collective effort, so snappy questions and contained answers. Uh, I call Tom Arthur, please. Question one. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many households in the Renfrewshire South constituency have been assisted by the Scottish the Welfare Fund since 2013. Minister. Between April 2013 and September 2017, the Scottish Welfare Fund has helped 23,500 households in Renfrewshire, with over 5.6 million being granted in crisis grants and community care grants, providing a vital lifeline for people in Renfrewshire and across Scotland, helping those in desperate situations where they cannot afford to buy everyday items such as food, nappies or meet basic living costs. Tom Arthur. For that answer, I can ask the Minister to comment on what impact she believes UK Tory government welfare reform has had on pushing people into circumstances where they have needed the support of the Scottish Welfare Fund. Minister. Well, welfare measures passed since 2010 are expected to reduce annual spending in Scotland by £3.9 billion by 2020 2021. There is no doubt that the UK government's welfare reforms, in particular the inbuilt wait for the first payment of universal credit, is pushing people into crisis situations. In their report, the Trussell Trust highlighted a 17% increase in their food bank usage in universal credit full service areas, more than double the national average. The number of Scottish Welfare Fund crisis grant applications has also increased by 50% since the introduction of universal credit in Scotland, with 14% specifically due to delay in benefit payments. It really is now imperative that the UK Government takes action to reverse the freeze to working age benefits, remove the restriction in terms of child benefit for two children and halt the rollout of universal credit before more people are pushed into poverty. Maurice Corrie. <clears throat> could the, uh, could the uh, Minister tell me how many Armed Forces veterans' families have been assisted by the Scottish Welfare Fund in Renfrewshire South? Minister. I thank the member for that question. I don't have that detailed information to hand, but I'm very happy to source that and write to him accordingly. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister accept that the Scottish Government's 7% real terms cut to the Scottish Welfare Fund since 2013 means that um, councils have fewer resources and SPICE are saying that that means 26,000 fewer uh, or more crisis grant payments could have been made if the funding had kept pace with inflation? Minister. What I do accept is that the overall cut to the Scottish budget has made political choices for this government very difficult and we're doing our very best to support the most vulnerable in our community and I think our welfare fund uh, demonstrates that admirably. Yeah. Question two, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to people in Inverclyde in receipt of universal credit to assist them to have greater control over their household budget. Minister. Thank you. Since uh, we believe it's important to give people choice over how to manage their money, and since October, people making a new claim for universal credit in full service areas such as Inverclyde have had the choice to receive their universal credit award twice monthly and have their housing costs paid directly to their landlord. Since January this year, that choice has been extended to everyone in full service un universal credit areas. To the end of December, uh, some 5,800 people with new claims had been offered one or both of the Universal Credit Scottish Choices. Around 2,500 people have taken up one or both of those choices. Uh, and the, so far, as uh, we understand it, not only the delivery of those choices, but the information available uh, has been clearly understood by those in receipt of it and the choices are being used. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply and I think the information has been very helpful. And, but, and certainly given the extension of the universal credit choices to existing universal credit claimants, uh, how many households does the government expect to actually benefit once universal credit has been fully rolled out? Minister. We expect that up to 700,000 households in Scotland will be able to benefit from Universal Credit Scottish Choices by the end of the planned Universal Credit rollout by U the UK Government, which is currently timed for 2022. Question three, Emma Harker. 
Minister to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle loneliness and social isolation in South Scotland region. Minister. Thank you. As part of our engagement process, our draft strategy, which we launched in January, uh, has included the organisation of a series of events to hear from local communities and organisations. We've already hosted an event in Dumfries and there is one planned in Gala Shields. The draft strategy includes a commitment to consider the particular issues and barriers in terms of isolation in rural areas and it is important that we hear from communities in Scotland about what will make a difference for them. Emma Harper. I thank the Minister for that answer and welcome the Scottish Government strategy. Does the Minister agree that we should recognise the work that the National Rural Mental Health Forum, run by the mental health charity Support in Mind Scotland, is undertaken with respect to the unique challenges presented by rural isolation? Minister. Uh, I thank the member for that additional question. There are undoubtedly particular issues across all ages in our rural communities, highlighted, for example, by the Young Farmers campaign. The National Rural Mental Health Forum um, is a national network with a strong national network of rural people and stakeholders who are driving change to enable uh, people in rural communities to be open about their mental health with a solid evidence base and to improve uh, people's lives and create a programme to influence policymakers such as government. I'd encourage the Rural Mental Health Forum to contribute to the consultation on our draft strategy. I'm sure that they will be able to present a number of important uh, ideas for us to consider. Question four, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding the impact of universal credit in areas where it has been introduced. Minister. Thank you. Uh, as the member will know, the Scottish Government has long made our concerns about universal credit known to the UK Government. On the 21st of March last year, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities wrote to the DWP's then Secretary of State, Damien Green, raising a range of serious concerns and calling for a complete halt of universal credit rollout. On the 28th of September last year, I uh, wrote a joint letter with COSLA uh, based on significant evidence from our local authorities urging the DWP to reconsider and halt the rollout of universal uh, credit. And I also reiterated that request when I gave evidence to Westminster's Working Pensions Committee on the 24th of January this year. Unfortunately, the UK government has never indicated a willingness to engage with us on these issues and has instead forged ahead with a system that is clearly not suitable for the people who need it. The concessions that they made in the autumn last year, such as reducing the six-week wait for the first payment to five weeks, simply do not go far enough. And whilst I'm pleased that our uh, Scottish choices are being taken up uh, by people across Scotland, I'm well aware that we have only very limited powers over universal credit. We can't fix the problems caused by the UK government's decision to freeze the amounts paid or by the systemic problems in the rollout. Only the UK government can do that, and we will continue to press them in that regard. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that the Tories and Stirling Council have no faith in universal credit, given that they've called for the Council to spend £600,000 over the next three years to mitigate against it? And given that the Council's Public Safety Committee recently reported that victims of domestic abuse are losing their financial independence under universal credit single parent system, making it even more vulnerable in control and relationships. What more can be done to persuade the UK government to dispense with this system, halt it as a matter of urgency, and review the, and address these serious faults? Minister. Uh, I thank the member for that additional question. I am indeed aware of this, and it is further proof, if proof is needed, that universal credit is failing the people of Scotland. The DWP already have an ability to provide split payments through the alternative payment arrangements for a household where domestic or financial abuse is a problem. But that approach itself, in my view, shows a flawed understanding of the nature of domestic abuse and the controlling characteristics of it that victims suffer from. The Scottish Government is currently exploring with the DWP how we might exercise a choice uh, for people in Scotland in terms of universal credit by introducing split payments. However, that is additionally complicated by the fact that it is a reserved benefit. DWP will have to deliver any such choice for us, and of course, they will charge us for that. 
a far better solution would be for the DWP to pay attention to my colleague Dr Philippa Whitford's attempts in Westminster to have this changed at source in universal credit and have split payments by default. Question five, Jackson Carlaw. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the need to promote gender equality. Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, our position is that we will continue to take action to promote and achieve gender equality in our country. I'm pleased that a great deal of progress has been made on gender equality over recent years, uh, but there is always much more to do. Our recent action includes taking tangible steps to improve the lives of women and girls in Scotland and challenge inequality where it persists. Already this year, we have passed legislation on women's representation on public boards and on domestic abuse. We are taking forward action to tackle the gender pay gap and make work fairer for women, including by transforming our childcare offer, challenging pregnancy and maternity discrimination, and supporting women to return to work. And we continue to invest in tackling and preventing violence against women and girls and providing the support and the services that they need. Jackson Curran. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I was depressed to be made aware at the beginning of March that some 35 women were detained by the Iranian authorities for attempting just to attend a high-profile football fixture match in Iran, about which a number of my constituents have written to me. What a contrast uh, with Scotland, where we have not only taken important steps to encourage women and girls to become interested in football, but that success can be seen demonstrated by the success of the Scottish women's national football team, who qualified for their first major championships in Euro 2017 and have made an unbeaten start to the 2019 World Cup qualifying campaign. As Scotland is a nation that has made important advances encouraging women into football, will the Cabinet Secretary join me in urging FIFA and its member associations to do all that they can to ensure that the Iranian government lift this shameful ban and ensure gender equality for women both to participate and spectate at football and at other sporting activities in Iran? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Carlo for that question. Um, I will certainly raise the details um, of his request in relation to FIFA uh, with my colleagues in health who have the responsibility uh, for uh, sports policy. Uh, I think he makes a fair and uh, credible point, uh, particularly around the role of sport uh, and the, the, the impact that that can have in improving equality uh, for uh, women and girls. And um, I'll take that forward with health colleagues. Claire Adams. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And in the spirit of Mr Carlo's uh, question, I'd like to also congratulate the Scottish women's rugby team on their successes during the recent Six Nations. But does the Minister um, agree with me that full devolution of employment law in Scotland would um, fully equip this government to tackle gender inequality in the workplace in Scotland? Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I really don't want to get into any rivalry between uh, rugby and uh, football supporters. Uh, I am not much of an expert on either uh, sport other than to say that both have an uh, important place in our national life and indeed in our advances towards uh, equality. In terms of the substantive point that uh, Claire uh, Adamson raised, uh, as people are aware, employment law and indeed equality law remains uh, reserved uh, to the UK. So things like maternity and paternity rights uh, something which I know that the Women and Equalities Committee, the UK <coughs> Women and Equalities Committee, drew attention to yesterday uh, in, in their report on fathers in the workplace uh, are all reserved. Uh, the work that we are taking forward uh, with employers in terms of encouraging employers to take more flexible uh, approaches in terms of family friendly uh, working environments and working hours, uh, that is done by persuasion. Uh, we don't, uh, it's fair to say, have the full range of powers which would give us uh, more tools uh, and more choices in terms of how we take forward uh, fairness at work, uh, just being one example. Question six, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what support it offers to people from lower income backgrounds to tackle inequality. Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to supporting those in low incomes and tackling inequality. We are taking a wide range of actions, such as our continued commitment to the living wage, delivering 72,500 affordable homes, significantly increasing the investment of free childcare and early learning, providing free school meals for all P1 to P3 pupils, and throughout school for those pupils from low income households providing a baby box to every newborn child in Scotland and investing in free prescriptions and residential care. 
In addition, we are also spending £750 million on the Retainment Challenge and driving forward the recommendations of our Commission on Widening Access so that every child, no matter their background or circumstances, has an equal chance of going to university by 2030. On top of that, we also invest £100 million a year in welfare mitigation uh, to protect those on low incomes uh, from the worst impacts of UK government welfare cuts. And we will, of course, go further with a range of actions in our Child Poverty Delivery Plan, which I look forward to sharing with Parliament next week. Rachel Hamilton. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that a big barrier to tackling inequality felt by young people in rural and hard to get to areas is the cost associated with travel to apprenticeships, further or even higher education? And will the, Minister, uh, will the Cabinet Secretary look into areas to help young people on limited budgets living in rural areas, facing unforeseen expenses to help them access opportunities and tackle inequality? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, indeed. I'm sure the, the member is also aware of the consultation that's been led by the Minister uh, for uh, Transport, uh, whom's a use of in terms of um, our, our broader transport policy, and there are also proposals uh, in particular to assist uh, young modern apprenticeships uh, with the cost of travel. Uh, we do, of course, understand and appreciate that there are additional barriers, uh, particularly for young people in rural communities, uh, transport being one of them, uh, and uh, in terms of the, the, the the tone and tenor of the member's question will certainly take that forward. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. In September, it was reported that 104,000 pensioners were missing out on £238 million of pension credit. And the government then spent a quarter of a million pounds on an older person's benefit uptake campaign. Um, is the Cabinet Secretary able to see how many people responded and how many um, older people are now uh, better off as a result? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that information will be published uh, shortly. Uh, in terms of the broader issue, in terms of uh, council tax uh, relief, we invest uh, heavily uh, in the council tax reduction scheme. Um, and it should be uh, an important point to always stress that relief is there and available uh, to affected uh, households. Of course, councils should be publicising the relief when bills are issued, uh, and it has featured uh, in our benefits maximisation campaigns, uh, as acknowledged uh, by Mr Griffin, and we will get back to him about the specific information that he has requested. Question 7, Kezia Dugdale. Do you ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that people do not lose universal credit because of the starter rate of income tax? Minister. This is an issue which clearly highlights the complexities of our current devolution settlement. Universal credit claimants who pay tax at the starter rate are benefiting from Scottish income tax policy. They will pay less income tax than they would anywhere else in the UK because of the new band we have created. The UK government controls policy for universal credit and has stipulated that it should be calculated according to an individual's income after tax. This means that whenever we reduce tax for an individual, the UK government's rules will operate to reduce their universal credit entitlement. We're aware of the complex interaction between Scottish income tax policy and entitlement to universal credit, which is reserved to the UK government, and will continue to engage with them as universal credit is rolled out across Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. I thank the Minister for that answer and she will of course be aware of the work of the Low Income Tax Reform Group which have told us that someone on the starter rate will only get £7, not the £20 that the Scottish Government promised them. I do understand however that the fiscal framework makes provision for a transfer back to the Scottish Government. So can I ask the Minister whether she's asked for this money, uh, how much it is and how she'll pass it on to the people who will be affected? Minister. I thank Ms Dugdale for that supplementary. Of course, it is not the Scottish Government's fault that individuals receive less as a consequence of the UK Government's rules on universal credit. I have explained that it is because the, the UK Government's rules on universal credit benefit they control, say that it will be calculated after tax, that where we increase an individual's income as a consequence of our tax policy, it is the UK Government that reduces that income because of how they apply their universal credit rules. And I, my colleagues on my left, only uh, in terms of this chamber, seating arrangements of course, my colleagues on the left may shout and moan and claim as much as they like, but they really do have to accept responsibility for the, their party in government at a UK level whose decisions on universal credit 
make the situation precisely as I, I have described it. Now, to Ms Dugdale's supplementary question. As she knows from the answer that Mr Mackay gave in the chamber previously, we are currently in discussions with the UK government on this matter in terms of how those arrangements work. It is more complex than it might first appear, as these matters always are, in terms of the fiscal framework in the Smith Commission. Of course, the real answer to all of this is to pass all of the powers to this Parliament yeah. so that we control yeah. everything in terms of social security and taxation, and we can go on and do a better job than we're receiving from down south. Question eight, Fulton McGregor. So to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to mark the UN International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I congratulate Mr McGregor on bringing forward the motion debated earlier today to mark uh, this very significant day and for securing cross-party support uh, for the debate. To mark the day, I published a blog on our Fairer Scotland website in which I highlighted the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights this year, noting that it is as relevant today as the day it was signed. <coughs> I also referred to the Independent Race Equality Advisors report and her 70 recommendations which formed the starting point uh, for a race equality action plan. In addition, I was pleased to announce also uh, that we'll provide funding of around £70,000 to one of our key race equality partners, BEMIS, to deliver a, a programme of local and national events aimed at involving minority ethnic young people in the Year of Young People. And I'm also very much looking forward to attending an event tomorrow uh, hosted by Show Racism, the Red Card, which will celebrate young people's creativity in tackling racism. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I welcome the actions being taken by this government to tackle racism, but does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is actions that matter and that all workplaces and establishments, including political parties, should adopt a zero-tolerance approach towards racism and discrimination of minorities? Cabinet Secretary. I do agree with that, presiding officer. Uh, the member is right to uh, highlight that a zero tolerance approach is needed towards racial uh, and racial discrimination uh, and that that's a response that we all need to be consistent with uh, and it's a response that is indeed uh, needed now. Um, I agree with the point that strong and effective action must be taken against anyone committing what is in fact uh, a racist uh, hate crime. Uh, all those in leadership positions in public life uh, must make clear the rejection of racist and Islamic phobic abuse uh, and take action against anyone who makes uh, such uh, statements. It was, of course, uh, good to see a united front at the weekend from both Anas Sarwar and Humza Yusuf uh, about the racist and Islamic pho phobic abuse that they routinely experience, which I'm sure uh, we're all absolutely uh, appalled at. But it is, of course, important to stress that it's not just for Anas Sarwar uh, and Humza Yusuf to stand uh, united on this issue. It's the responsibility of each and every one of us uh, to stand united and to tackle racism in all its forms. Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Will the Scottish Government support calls from BEMIS Scotland to ensure that Scotland's national identity is as inclusive as it can be, including the integration of refugees and asylum seekers into Scottish society? Will the Cabinet Secretary join with me and agree that anti-refugee sentiment has no place in Scotland and no place in our society? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I indeed, I agree on Scotland, uh, many cultures, and I hope the member will agree with me that she has seen that reflected uh, in the, the good uh, cross-party uh, Civic Scotland work that we've taken forward in terms of our integration strategy uh, for new Scots in particular. Question nine, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle period poverty. Cabinet Secretary. Side officer, in our programme for government published in September last year, we committed to introducing a scheme to fund access to free sanitary products in schools, colleges and universities. Scottish Government officials are currently working with key stakeholders, including COSLA officials, uh, including the Scottish Funding Council, Colleges Scotland, Universities Scotland, to ensure uh, provision can be put in place uh, by the autumn term this year. We're also committed to consider further action to support others on low incomes in light of the findings of the current uh, pilot scheme in Aberdeen. The pilot is currently being evaluated and I am pleased to say that I've also recently announced that we would continue to make sanitary products available to those who took part in the pilot uh, while the evaluation is completed. 
Stuart Stevenson. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the urgency that this matter has for people in Aberdeenshire, where the Tory-led Council has now determined that uh, those who require such products have to come forward from them, thus potentially stigmatising those who require them by reason of poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, I agree that free and accessible provision in schools is vital to tackling this issue, which is why this government has committed to making this happen in schools across Scotland uh, from the start of the next uh, <coughs> academic year. Recent research uh, we carried out in partnership with Young Scott found that having to ask a member of staff for sanitary products was the least popular option uh, amongst those in education. And officials have worked closely with stakeholders informed by this very important research uh, to develop a set of guiding principles for provision and those principles include ensuring dignity is front and centre and that students views are taken into account in developing the delivery approach and it appears that the approach of Aberdeenshire Council is not consistent with student views or our guiding principles and I would encourage them uh, to look again at their delivery approach in consultation uh, with students uh, and I you know certainly stand ready and my officials uh, stand ready to assist either uh, the MSP for the area or indeed councillors or officials. Monica Lennon, as you've already had a supplementary, briefly please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I commend the Scottish Government's work on the Aberdeen Pilot Scheme. I've been to visit and see finding the volunteers are doing fantastic work. Is the Cabinet Secretary able to say when the interim report or anonymised data from the pilot scheme will be shared and if the Government will come to a view on the merits of universal access? Cabinet Secretary. So we're working very hard to do that as uh, quickly as possible. Um, it won't be done before Easter, but I certainly hope uh, and will endeavour to make sure that that work is complete before the summer months. Question 10, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what its policy is regarding empty homes in the private sector. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Empty homes can be a blight on communities and are a wasted resource at a time when people across Scotland need homes. Our policy provides support to local authorities and other organisations to encourage private owners to bring their properties back into use. Uh, we work with the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership to deliver an advisory helpline and a network of dedicated empty homes officers across Scotland uh, with more than 2,800 homes brought back into use since 2010. Uh, we committed to doubling the funding for the partnership and the programme for government uh, and want to see empty homes officer support in every local authority. I'm pleased to see the hard work of the partnership come to fruition uh, with a new empty homes officer post agreed by Aberdeen City Council last week. Uh, local authorities also have the power to charge an empty homes levy under the council tax variation for unoccupied dwelling Scotland regulations that we introduced in 2013 as an additional tool uh, to encourage the private owners of these properties to bring them back into use and we provide dedicated funding through the 4.5 million pounds empty homes loan fund and the 4 million pounds town centre empty homes fund. Lewis MacDonald. I welcome the Minister's answer, as indeed I welcome the decision uh, by Aberdeen City Council last week, and, and in particular I welcome his support for a network of empty homes officers. There is evidence that there is a direct correlation between such dedicated posts and success uh, in bringing empty homes back into use. I wonder if the Minister could tell us today, he's mentioned the levy, uh, does he believe that local authorities uh, now have all the powers they need uh, in order to tackle this problem? Minister. Um, Presiding officer, I know that the, uh, the levy is being used. Um, I have no evidence from local authorities to say that that's not working. Um, I am always more than listen, uh, willing to listen to what local authorities have to say uh, or in these kind of areas. Uh, and if they come forward with uh, further proposals, I will certainly consider them. Uh, we want to do all that we can uh, to ensure that these empty homes are brought back into use. Question 11, Andy Whiteman. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to incorporate the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights into Scots law. Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, many of the rights identified in international human rights treaties already find expression in the law of Scotland, including rights set out in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. The First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership, chaired by Professor Alan Miller, 
uh, has been asked to consider the potential effects of incorporating international human rights treaties into domestic law and the means by which this might in practice be undertaken. The group will make its recommendations by the end of uh, this year. And we are uh, clear that any mechanism designed to secure the further incorporation of international treaties must be practical, it must be deliverable, and it must result in genuine improvements in the everyday lived experience of individuals across the whole of Scottish society. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, given the government's commitment to deliver a collaborative process to determine the rights that should be incorporated and given the recent report by the Equality and Human Rights Commission on Great Britain's lack of progress in implementing it, um, does the, can the Cabinet Secretary advise me on her view as to what should be the first right or rights to be incorporated? Oh. Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, yeah, there's a question. Uh, thank you very much for that, Mr uh, Whiteman. I think I would be all day if I was to uh, stand here and give my deliberations uh, on the hoof, although I do indeed, uh, as you'd expect, have some uh, personal uh, preferences. I think it's really important uh, in this instance uh, that we uh, allow uh, the First Minister's uh, advisory group, uh, which will give important leadership uh, on this area. As I said in my uh, original answer, uh, what we have been cleared clear about as a government is that uh, incorporation, uh, the benefits of thus uh, needs to be practical and actually deliver uh, real improvements uh, to real folk uh, in their uh, real lives and I think it's fair to say there's a job of work to do in terms of understanding that mechanism uh, and process better in terms of how we uh, get to that place. In terms of the issue around uh, collaboration, uh, it's important uh, for the member to be aware that the advisory group uh, is certainly, uh, it will meet every, every few months uh, and will be working hard to collaborate uh, right across across um, Civic Scotland and I'm sure the member uh, would be able to take opportunities to feed into that process. Question 12, Annie Wells. To ask the Scottish Government when the Gypsy Traveller Ministerial Working Group last met. Cabinet Secretary. The Ministerial Working Group on Gypsy Travellers met for the first time on the 1st of February 2018 and the minutes of that meeting have been published on the Scottish Government website and there will be three further meetings this year and we will share a set of draft actions uh, early in 2019. Annie Wills. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and I'm pleased to hear that the group met in February. Considering the broad scope of the Ministerial Group and that it is working across government portfolios, how will the Cabinet Secretary seek to record and measure data specific to Gypsy Traveller community so that we maintain a realistic view of progress? Cabinet Secretary. I think the member raises a fair point in terms of the, the importance of data uh, consistent with our approach um, across the range of equalities. We need to ensure we've got the right data. It also needs to be proportionate uh, in that we could invest all our time and all our money um, you know, contemplating and completing research and seeking out data. So it is important to say that given there's also rightly an imperative on the government to act, uh, that we need to have a proportionate approach um, to data. Uh, but it is uh, a, a fair question. Our overall approach is laid out in our equality uh, evidence uh, website uh, and our, our, we published a strategy um, you know, some months back in terms of equality evidence. Uh, in terms of measurable success, um, I would just also like to emphasise uh, to the member that both myself as the chair of this ministerial working group and every minister involved in that working group is absolutely determined uh, to, to, to reach demonstrable progress uh, for issues of inequality that have impacted uh, on the Gypsy Traveller community who it is well established uh, are in terms of outcomes uh, experience uh, the worst outcomes across a range of indicators uh, of any group in Scotland and we're determined uh, to put that right. Question 13, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the recent rollout of universal credit and the impact that this has had on vulnerable people in Scotland. Minister. Thank you. Um, as the member will recall, when I wrote to uh, the GWP Secretary of State in September last year, a joint letter with COSLA calling for the rollout to be uh, halted, we included evidence from local authorities 
uh, that they, uh, who had been on universal credit the longest, that they were experience, uh, experiencing rent arrears for universal credit claimants of two and a half times more than those on housing benefit, and also had reported an increase in the administrative cost to them, which was up to three times more than the funding received through their delivery of a partnership agreement with the DWP. Additionally, we know of the demand impact on the Scottish Welfare Fund, which we've already touched on. Whilst uh, our Scottish choices in terms of the direct payment uh, of rent to both social and private landlords uh, are relatively new, introduced uh, for new claimants in October and rolled out for existing claimants in January, I am hopeful, given the take-up so far, that this will not only benefit individual claimants, but will also benefit landlords themselves in terms of those rent arrears. Nonetheless, that is only one part of the difficulty with universal credit, and we are well aware of the impact of that across Scotland. David Torrance. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware that universal credit was introduced in Fife in December. The local authority's head of revenue and commercial services didn't mince his words when he said, and I quote, I can see a car crash happening when universal credit is fully rolled out. Given that we, we are witnessing a sharp rise in rent arrears, food bank referrals, and crisis grants in local authorities where universal credit has been rolled out. Does the Scottish Government agree this is indicative of a system that isn't working properly? And what additional support, if any, has the UK Government provided to Scotland to address these challenges and to as it continue to push forward with a disastrous mm. rollout? A wee bit too long-winded. Trim it next time, please, Mr Torrance. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I do agree, of course, and have said previously and many times that I think that the rollout of universal credit should be halted and the problems fixed in terms of the systemic problems, but also the policy which freezes the benefits within universal credit should be addressed uh, by the UK government. And I don't understand, uh, other than not wanting to lose face, why any sensible government wouldn't do as we are urging them to do. I have to say, though, that the UK government has not provided any additional support to help address the problems being faced, despite being repeatedly uh, demonstrated to them the problems and the impact on our local authorities as well, indeed, as this government. Question 14, Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Scottish social security system will support people seeking to appeal decisions. Minister. Thank you. Um, we have always been clear that people uh, will have a right to challenge if they believe that the Social Security Agency has not made the right decision and that we should make that process as simple and straightforward as possible. So I'm pleased that we have the support at stage two uh, for the amendments I brought forward to make the appeal process easier whilst retaining the individual's right to decide what they want to do. These amendments will ensure that the agency does all it can to help an individual with an appeal, including information about the process, providing the right form to make an appeal, and signposting the individual to organisations who can provide independent support to them through the process. The process. In addition, and in contrast with the current system, I have also amended the bill to ensure that we will make short-term financial assistance available where a continuing payment has been reduced or stopped and that decision is being challenged. And we will not use the removal of financial support to pressure individuals to accept decisions that they believe are wrong. Joe McAlpine. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, in the new Scottish system, uh, you have mentioned that financial support Will, will not be removed. Um, could you give us some details about the timing of that in terms of um, when a new decision is made? Um, because obviously um, removing financial support uh, results in a cliff edge of having no, no support at all uh, when they appeal the decision. Minister. Well, the, the introduction of short-term assistance is there uh, precisely to ensure that an individual is not financially penalised whilst they are uh, pursuing their right to challenge a decision of the Social Security Agency in Scotland uh, right through to appeal at tribunal level. Now, at the end of that stage, when the tribunal has reached its decision, then the agency will uh, pay whatever level of benefit the tribunal has determined the individual is due. I, I hope that uh, provides the member with the answer that she's seeking, although I am, of course, happy to talk with her further to understand what we are proposing. Last question, Jeremy Balfour, supplementary. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware at present the Social Security Bill doesn't allow a claimant an appeal uh, to the First Tier Tribunal if there's an overpayment issue. Uh, will she look at that issue afresh um, and keep the system as is at the moment where the agency makes a decision on overpayment and the claimant disagrees with that, he or she will be allowed an appeal to the First Tier Tribunal? Minister. I thank Mr Balfour for raising that because this addresses a fundamental misunderstanding of what is in the bill. There is, in fact, a right to appeal because if the, if the agency says to an individual, you have been overpaid, it does so because it has made a new determination. And a determination is open to challenge right through to appeal. So uh, any uh, view on the part of the agency that an individual has been overpaid is as open to challenge and straight through to appeal as any other determination that the agency might make. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. I apologise to the five members I've been unable to take.